Good evening, and welcome to our third UW Now live stream event, uh, the Cabin Fever edition, we might call it. Uh, I'm Mike Knetter from the Wisconsin Foundation and Alumni Association, and tonight we'll focus on public health with special emphasis on what's going on here at UW Health, uh, the hospitals and clinics, and our School of Medicine and Public Health. Our guests tonight are Dr. Peter Newcomer, who is the Chief Clinical Officer for UW Health, and he'll discuss testing, treatment, and care that's going on in our hospital system. And Dean Robert Golden, who is the Dean of the School of Medicine and Public Health, who will discuss how the school is fulfilling its traditional missions of research, education, and service in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. Our format, as it has been in the past, will enable each of our guests to give opening remarks, uh, about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll go to a live Q&A, including audience questions through the live chat feature on YouTube. So we'll begin tonight with Dr. Newcomer. And before you kick off, let me just say, Doctor, a big thank you to you and your colleagues for all of the excellent care you're providing to people in our community. Dr. Newcomer. Thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate that as, as our entire team. Uh, happy to be here to talk a little bit about what we've been doing over the last six weeks or so in response to this crisis uh, at UW Health. Go to the next slide. So I wish I could say we were overly prepared for this as a health system, as a community, uh, and as a country, but of course we weren't. And that's led to some things we've had to do over the last six weeks that none of us could have predicted. Um, we will be much better prepared uh, for the next one. Uh, we just weren't for this. And I'll, I'll go over some of the things we had to do in such a short time frame because of that. So we'll go to the next slide. What we uh, first thought about, of course, was what a lot of people have heard about now, which is bending the curve, trying to get the peak down so that we could manage the number of cases in our county and our region and, and really in our state and uh, not have a peak that we couldn't handle. And so if you look at uh, some of the places that have a peak like this, and then go to the next slide, uh, New Orleans is an example. This is from this morning. This shows what that peak looks like in a number of case counts. We in late February saw what was happening in Italy and really decided we had to do everything we possibly could to get that uh, peak down. Or if we couldn't, because it isn't just up to any health system, uh, what could we do to meet the maximal need of the maximal number of patients? How could we save the most lives and care for the most people with COVID-19? So I'm gonna go over a couple of those things we did on the next slide. We put together uh, really very quickly an incident command structure. Normally those are set up for things like a fire or something that happens uh, very briefly. We had to put up a modified structure that was gonna last for months and still in place today in one of our main conference rooms with our leaders there making decisions on a uh, regular timely basis about all of these things. The things you need are space, stuff, and staff, the three S's of responding to a pandemic. You need to figure out where you're gonna put people if you have a surge in patients. You need to figure out what stuff you have to care for them and to keep your staff and your physicians safe. That's things like personal protective equipment, masks, uh, face shields, gloves, gowns, ventilators and breathing circuits that go in ventilators. How many do you have and how well do they work and where are they? You need to get a quick inventory. That's what we started doing right away. And then how are you gonna care for all those patients? How are you gonna redeploy your staff, potentially from an ambulatory environment, from the clinics to the inpatient environment? Uh, how do you make sure that you have enough uh, physicians who are trained and able to care for what could be hundreds of patients in an intensive care unit when you normally only have uh, a dozen or two in the health system? And go to the next slide. So we uh, really very uh, quickly turned off all of our care that we could turn off. So any non-essential uh, operative or procedural care or even outpatient-based care that didn't need to occur, we turned off both to protect our patients from coming into a health system, but also to protect our staff and to preserve that personal protective equipment and redeploy that staff into that space that we were freeing up to meet the needs. We worked on virtual care expansion, very quickly uh, launching telehealth platforms that we had planned uh, for months into the future. We did over the course of a couple of weeks to meet the needs of those patients who were at home and uh, again, to protect everyone as best we could. And then we went through the really difficult task of looking at all of our space. We had our facilities team work over the course of a couple of weeks to look at every part of our organization across multiple hospitals and all of our clinics 
and say, hey, what could we do differently? We looked at places like our digestive health center where we do colonoscopies and upper endoscopies and, and we empty that out because most of that was um, non-urgent care and the urgent stuff that needed to happen in that space, we moved into the hospital. And that building we decided we could use as inpatient space. We emptied out one of our hospitals completely to be ready for uh, a surge in inpatients, uh, both uh, floor-based inpatients, but also ICU-based patients. And then we developed a staffing plan that was incredibly complicated, uh, involving uh, all kinds of different providers doing work they hadn't done before and an education plan uh, to get them up to speed and a structure that left a uh, uh, someone who was very skilled at either intensive care or inpatient care uh, at the top of uh, a team uh, to protect everyone uh, during that environment. Go you know to the next slide. I have some pictures to show some of the things that we've done. One of the big things you find out in a crisis is the most important thing you can do for your staff, for your patients, and for your communi community is really to communicate all the time. So we started communication, not just daily, but multiple times daily to our teams. We built a website that faced externally to uh, tell people what we were doing and also to inform our patients. Um, and uh, we worked on public communication. We have a daily uh, message with our uh, press uh, colleagues, and we have a physician, I think, on one to three times daily giving updates uh, to the press around the region and the state. So people know what's going on and, and get the information from the health system, uh, uh, not just from other places. We partnered with the State Emergency Operations Command to learn what was happening across our region and the state and to learn how we could work together with our peers uh, around our state. And we communicated electronically. At one point, we sent out half a million MyChart messages, uh, which is an epic tool to communicate with patients uh, so that we could tell them what we were doing and why we thought they were uh, safer at home for some of those non-essential visits and procedures that we talked about earlier. We can go to the next slide. Uh, this is showing one of the most important things you can do early in any uh, epidemic or pandemic, uh, which is testing. We need to figure out who has uh, COVID-19 and we need to do it in a safe way for everyone. So over the course of uh, 48 to 72 hours, we put up a drive through testing center, uh, a testing center that allowed our staff to be safe, uh, but also allowed them to test patients uh, and staff and preoperative patients even uh, to protect our operative environments in a drive through setting on the west side of Madison and get those tests done in our own organization. Our lab got up to speed very quickly with doing these lab tests and resulting our COVID-19 tests so that we knew what we were dealing with. And that goes on uh, today. Um, we can go to the next slide. And then the next slide, yeah. And then so the other thing is, I talked a little bit earlier about the personal protective equipment. One of the most important things you can do is to figure out your supply chains. And it turns out in this crisis, Everyone was trying to figure that out at exactly the same time around our country and around the world. And there really wasn't supply chains to tap into. Um, I had emails from uh, almost every uh, friend and cousin that I have saying they had a contact uh, somewhere in the world that had you know, five masks or four face shields. Most of those didn't pan out. Some of them did. We contacted every one of them because we really needed to buff up our supplies. Uh, actually, we had some really great involvement of our community with the dental community, our construction colleagues across Dane County, donating masks, uh, both barrier masks and N95 masks. We had to set up a donation drop-off uh, over at 20 South Park to collect all of that stuff uh, on a regular basis. It was really uh, heartening to see that type of community involvement, and it really has helped us maintain our supply for our healthcare workers, in particular our frontline staff caring for COVID patients. We also need to preserve what we use, and we had to make some of our own. We were starting to run out of face shields, and we partnered with the School of uh, Engineering, and they developed a 3D printed face shield for us, um, and uh, and then had that built, uh, working with one of our local design companies, and that's something that has kept that supply uh, really real time for us. Um, we also uh, needed to find, and we can go to the next slide, ways to reuse what we had. Uh, you've heard this, I'm sure, in the press. Some of the things that we have, like N95 masks, the supply chain just isn't uh, large enough and isn't turning on rapidly enough for us to be able to uh, use as many as we would like to use. So we actually partnered with 3M in Minnesota and looked at the different ways we could uh, decontaminate those masks to use them again. And we found a way uh, that allowed us to use them up to three times safely and really approved through the company that made those masks 3M. So that, that was a huge win for us and it's kept us up to speed with our supplies. We'll go to the next slide. We also partnered with the university in other ways. So some of you may recognize uh, these places, the Jope uh, Residence Hall and Lowell uh, Center. Uh, we're using both of those for both staff who have worked and 
with COVID patients who don't want to go home and expose their family, they can go to the dorm for as long as they'd like, and that's uh, free of charge to them. And then the Lowell Hall for patients who don't have a safe place to go with a diagnosis of COVID-19, uh, we can put them there and they get nurse checks three times a day, uh, uh, meals. It's really a uh, wonderful support from the university for our patients uh, in UW Health. And then we'll go to the next. Uh, this is uh, really the screening that we're doing. So the other thing we have to do is protect everyone in the hospitals and in the clinics by screening both employees and patients for symptoms and make sure they don't come into the hospitals with symptoms. But also uh, we had to change our visitors policies, uh, which is one of the toughest things we had to do. And most health systems have done this pretty extensively. The one thing we didn't wanna do was turn off all visitors. And so we have sacrificed uh, uh, really staff time and PPE to be sure that we get visitors there when we need them. Examples, end of life care. One example that's come up in the last week uh, that I just really kind of end my conversation with is one that really um, was uh, with our nursing teams and our COVID uh, unit, our intensive care unit. We had an elderly couple, both with uh, COVID-19. The husband was actually uh, dying and uh, was able to talk to us uh, and was in palliative care. And the wife was in another unit uh, and she was doing a little bit better. He was calling for her on a regular uh, basis and uh, really was asking to be reunited with his wife of uh, many years. And our nurses worked with infection control and our infectious disease doctors to get together a plan to safely bring him into the room, and uh, her into the room with him and give them some time together. And uh, I talked to the nurses when I was rounding in that unit the other day. And I'll tell you, the, the looks on their faces, the smiles on their faces that they were able to bring that type of closure to our patients reminded me of what we're all doing. It's not just about space and stuff and staff. It's really uh, all about people that we care for. And uh, that was a great moment for us. And, and uh, I know the teams would, would want me to share that with you. And, uh, the last thing I'll show is kind of where we're, well, we're taking that off, but yeah, thanks, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Newcomer, uh, for that story and, and your remarks. And I'm sure your cousins out in the listening audience are primed with questions for you. So I'm sure we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but first, we'll hear from the longest serving dean at the University of Wisconsin Madison, the dean of our School of Medicine and Public Health, uh, dear friend Bob Golden. Bob? Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate this opportunity to be with you tonight. I do have to admit, this is a little bit of a strange experience. I've been looking forward to talking with all of you and I hope to share with you some meaningful information, but what makes it a bit odd is that I have no way of seeing you, no way of telling if the information is getting through, no way of knowing if we're actually connecting. In other words, this is going to be like the experience of raising a teenager. So here goes. As Mike mentioned, our School of Medicine and Public Health really rests on three pillars, service, research, and education. And I'm going to organize my, my, my talk with you based on those three pillars, starting with the foundational piece of uh, service. And of course, the bedrock of that pillar is clinical care. And I just have to uh, say that uh, uh, Pete and his colleagues are really there demonstrating heroic dedication to our patients, serving on a dangerous frontline battle in the face of limited resources, as, as, as Pete described. But in addition to clinical care, our faculty and staff are really stepping up in other ways, providing service at the federal, state, and local levels. For example, at the federal level, our Associate Dean for Public Health, John Tempty, is serving on the United States COVID-19 Vaccine Working Group. At the state level, from day one, we began to really work on a collaborative basis in developing the all-important testing capacity. As Pete mentioned, UW Health has its own in-house testing capacity, which just this week doubled in its uh, ability to uh, run samples. We've also, as a School of Medicine and Public Health, been providing the oversight and leadership for the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene. But what's really been amazing is how people have come together. There has been a partnership formed with some of the big national biotech companies that are headquartered right here in Madison, in particular, Promega and Exact Sciences. And I wanna give a shout out to their CEOs, Bill Linton and Kevin Conroy, respectively. 
they have really set the stage for creating what we call the Wisconsin Clinical Lab Network, bringing together the private and the academic uh, enterprises to develop large-scale effective diagnostic testing that can serve the entire state. The state's State Disaster Medical Advisory Committee is chaired by one of our clinical department chairs, Dr. Azita Hamadani, uh, and it includes among its membership, Dr. Nazia Safdar, who presented two weeks ago at the inaugural episode of this uh, program. Our faculty and staff from many departments and also some of our centers have been redeployed to serve the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, doing important tasks related to epidemiology and contact tracing and other important aspects of uh, getting our hands around this pandemic. At the local level, Dr. Newcomer mentioned about the Lowell Center being used as an isolation facility for infected patients. Well, a call went out for volunteers, not clinicians, but straight up staff that they needed to really run the place. And I was so impressed at our brave staff members who immediately signed up to put themselves in harm's way to make sure that the administrative and pure service needs are being met for that uh, population. Then another really amazing local uh, story is how the school and the UW Health directors have really come together in partnership with SSM, with Unity Point Meritor, and all three of these local health systems are pooling resources, recognizing that we have to all hang together during this crisis. Shifting to our research mission, our school is advancing COVID-19 research throughout the campus and also across the state. Let's start with the very important aspect of COVID testing. And here, three of our faculty, doctors Miriam Shalef, David O'Connor, and David Yang, have really performed amazing uh, leadership in jump-starting things. We've been involved in both national and local collaborative efforts to not only expand the diagnostic testing, but also develop a new type of test that you've probably been hearing about in the news, antibody or serology testing. Now, what this means is that we want to be able to test the blood of people to make sure we can identify those individuals who have successfully fought and won the battle against COVID. And we have to do that in a way that really identifies the specific COVID-19 coronavirus as opposed to other less dangerous coronaviruses that we all have been exposed to in the past. By doing this, it will help us identify those people who are safely protected now from the disease, we hope. And that will be very important in jumpstarting the return of our economy and also in making sure that we identify those uh, doctors and nurses who can safely return to work after they have uh, been infected with the uh, COVID-19 uh, illness. Now, Dr. Miriam Shalef is also seeking resources to create a biorepository of serum samples from COVID patients. Those important materials can be used to validate these new antibody tests to make sure that they have the sensitivity and specificity that we need to have. Now, related to these antibodies is another exciting clinical trial that we are a part of. This is a trial looking at convalescent plasma, taking the blood of patients who we can document have developed the necessary antibodies to defeat this virus, and then carefully infusing them in patients who have been matched to see if we can take those antibodies, think of them as bullets that can be fired against the uh, coronavirus. If we can take those bullets from those patients who have won that shootout, and now give them to patients who are very seriously ill as extra ammunition to boost their own immune system and help them recover from the illness as well. We're also working with the School of Veterinary Medicine to develop some non-human primate models for testing potential new therapeutics and vaccines. And also we are, as a school, supporting research that goes across the whole campus and the state. I hope you're familiar with the Wisconsin Partnership Program, the large endowment created more than 15 years ago from the Blue Cross Blue Shield conversion. Well, the Wisconsin Partnership Program announced early in the epidemic 
that it was arranging in its first round of funding one and a half million dollars to help jumpstart COVID research across this entire campus, but also to help support projects in the community throughout the state with grassroots community groups coming up with proposals of ways in which they can help with the epidemic in their own community and taking care of the families who have been struck by it. And then finally, our scientists and our educators are developing uh, an amazing process that Pete referred to of donating their own equipment and supplies to help with uh, the uh, frontline doctors and nurses. Let me also say just a few words about education. Like the rest of the campus, we have faced an unbelievable challenge in having to very rapidly switch from in-person to virtual delivery of all of our curricula for our MD students, all of our health profession students, and even our graduate students as well. But we're also developing educational tools for the entire state. For example, a group of our surgeons have developed a toolkit for clinicians that help train them in how to discuss the complicated issues that come up when people are seriously ill with their family members and help guide them in educating the family members and the patients about the options and the choices that they will have to make, especially when the illness progresses. So this horrible epi epidemic is actually bringing out the best in people throughout our university and throughout our, our, our city and our, in our nation. I'd like to share just a tiny sample from an enormous pool of exceptional contributions. Our Wisconsin's Alzheimer's Disease Research Center for more than three years now has been offering free year-round day and night exercise classes for the people with Alzheimer's disease who are participating in their programs. With the spread of COVID-19, of course, this program had to move to several online options. When one of the faculty members in that program, Dr. Carrie Gleason, learned that several of the participants didn't have the necessary technology to participate, she provided them with loaner Chromebooks of her own so that they could continue to be part of the group. Another shout out to one of our graduating fourth year medical students, Kavita Kanwar, who had been a nurse before enrolling in the MD program. Well, she decided to really step up and in the few months between when we um, finish the curriculum and when she's gonna be starting her residency, she's volunteering on the front lines as a nurse again to provide relief for the uh, full-time staff that are really burning the candle at both ends. Then uh, I also wanna give a shout out to our Clinical Simulation Center program led by Shannon DeMarco. They were given the challenge of quickly training up all of our staff and how to properly take on and take off the personal protective equipment. And within 24 hours of being given that assignment, they worked literally around the clock and trained more than a thousand UW Health employees within five days. At the same time, of course, practicing social distancing. And then finally, a special, special shout out to our wonderful donors and supporters all over the country who have really come forward to help build up the COVID response funds that will be so important in advancing both the research missions as well as the clinical care missions in the university and in UW Health. So here's some final thoughts before we open it up for questions. As I hope you know, about 15 years ago, we began a radical revolutionary experiment, defining what it means to transform into the nation's first School of Medicine and Public Health. I've got to say, in my worst nightmare, I never would have imagined such a horrible example of the critically important interplay between medicine and public health that we're seeing with COVID-19. But at the same time, in my wildest dreams, I couldn't have imagined such remarkable dedication and commitment and partnership from all of our faculty, staff, and students and the entire community. So uh, thank you for this opportunity to be with you. Now turn it back to Mike. Well, thank you, Bob. And uh, we will uh, go to audience questions. And while they're coming in, 
I would just like to start things out with a question to each of you. Um, maybe Pete, you can take this first. Is there anything that we've done differently as a result of this that we'll want to stick with long term? So were there will there be some long term benefits of having gone through this experience, either at UW Health or the School of Medicine and Public Health? Yeah, Pete? definitely, definitely, Mike. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I mentioned uh, during my uh, comments that there are some things that we're doing now that we were planning to do over the course of months to years that we did in weeks. Uh, telehealth is a great example something where in the past we might be uh, working hard with the doctors to get them to accept a new form of uh, providing care. And uh, this week they're telling us, get it to us tomorrow. So that is gonna stick with us long-term. The way we communicate and the way we make decisions, I think it is going to improve the decision-making being more facile, um, uh, more rapid. And the communication has been dramatically different from the standpoint of being proactive to our community, proactive uh, with all of our partners and with our our patients and staff, of course, big differences in, in, in those areas. Thank you, Dean Golden. Yeah, well, just as uh, Pete has made the point about uh, telemedicine, uh, in a similar way, teleeducation is really important. And for our health profession students, of course, the hands-on training is vitally important, but we have a statewide campus and we have students that are training throughout the uh, area and affiliated sites at La Crosse, at Marshfield and at Milwaukee. And this has really accelerated our development of teleeducation so that while they are getting their hands-on training in those other sites, they can be better connected through more sophisticated technology uh, back at the uh, uh, mothership in Madison. Great, thank you. Uh, we have an audience question from Don, uh, and, and this is related to uh, the number of cases, you know, Peter, we were talking earlier and you said there's maybe about 40 hospitalizations in Madison at the moment across the various uh, hospitals in our system. And that's quite a few uh, fewer uh, hospitalizations than we might have expected. So you mentioned we've kind of flattened out uh, what might have been a big peak. Because of that, do you think there'll be a second surge? Is it maybe more likely uh, that we'll see an uptick in cases later on because not enough people have been exposed this time around. Yeah, this is a this is a really difficult question, one we all want the answer to. We want to know when uh, the peak of our lowered uh, curve will be, how, how far off in the future it'll be, how long it will last, and will we have another? I think it's almost for certain that we're going to have not uh, a geometric model of one peak, um, but as we uh, intermittently close down our communities and open them up, we'll see changes in the volumes uh, until we have a more effective treatment, uh, more extensive testing, uh, or um, immunization uh, for uh, this virus. So I think, uh, I think the question is right. We'll probably have uh, multiple uh, peaks. I won't hate to call them surges because we want to keep them as small as possible so we can all manage them as well as possible. So, so that kind of leads to a next question. Um, if this is going to linger on a little bit, um, what conditions in your opinion would need to be met or in place to reopen our economy or society? And what might the new normal look like on the other side and maybe it, Bob, if you want to take a crack at that and Pete, you can chime in. Well, we have to find ourselves in the place that I wish we had been at the start of the epidemic. And that means that we need to have much more complete and readily available rapid testing, uh, testing to see uh, who has uh, the diagnosis. And also, as I mentioned, testing to see who has recovered uh, from it. And while we are building up capacity in the former, we have a long way to go in the latter. And that really needs to be in place. We also have to have a stronger public health infrastructure so that if there is an identified case based on rapid testing, that we have the mechanisms in place to trace their contacts and to make sure that we snuff out the uh, sparks that are going before we rekindle an entire forest fire. So better surveillance through better testing and a public health workforce that uh, is able to then follow up in real time those contacts and introduce them with um, uh, isolation. 
Um, Dr. Newcomer, do you want to add to that and then maybe take the second part, which is what would the new normal look like on the other side of this? Will people be ready to just charge back into the office? You know, we've been living in safer at home and I've been telling some of my colleagues uh, I'm happier at the office some days. <laughs> I think you really realize uh, how much uh, the family of your coworkers uh, means uh, to you and, and the same thing for our kids and their uh, their friends and students that they usually spend time with. I think the, to answer the question, I think one of the, um, the really important things is that's led to the decrease in the, in the spike of cases is the social distancing. And I think until there is a durable solution, whether that's vaccine or extensive testing and isolation, as uh, Dean Golden just said, um, we're gonna be living in a world where uh, social distancing is part of our reality both in our clinics, uh, in our care facilities where we have to develop spacing for people and have less volumes coming through, but also in our post office and in our grocery store. And I think that's gonna be fairly long-term, meaning months to over a year of change for us. We always we hope that at some point uh, over the course of the next year to year and a half, that can all go away again. But um, I think we're gonna see it for quite some time, unfortunately. Um, Bob, do you have thoughts about when we will have on-demand inexpensive testing available for whether people have the virus? Oh, it's, uh, it's really hard to say. Uh, ironically, what we are experiencing is problems with the uh, actual reagents, the supply chain for the reagents. Um, here in Madison, with the wonderful partnerships that I uh, described, we have the equipment, we have the people, we have the facilities, but like, everybody else, uh, we are struggling to get the actual chemical components of the test that are still in short supply. So um, we're, we're making progress, but I think that as some of the huge peaks around the world and in our country's hotspots begin to dampen down, uh, we here will be able to get greater, more reliable access to the materials we need so that we can run the available equipment at full capacity. Um, another question coming in from Jim, uh, and I have a corollary for it. Uh, do you have advice for snowbirds in Florida or Arizona who are wanting to come home, but they don't know if or when? And I'll just chime in and say, the people in Oneida County have been clear. They would just as soon I did not come up to my lake house from Madison right now. Thoughts about uh, snowbirds, uh, if and when to come home? Yeah, I mean, I have a few pa a few patients of my own uh, that I've talked to about this one. Um, and I think it's it's a tough question because it's a matter of timing and looking at the, uh, not only what's happening in your community from a standpoint of diagnoses and, and COVID-19, but what do you have around you from a standpoint of care? Uh, does your uh, community have a good medical care or not? And that's the first question I ask someone uh, who asked that question because it becomes very local very quick when we talk about uh, COVID-19 in a state. It really is about where you are at that time. So in general, I'd say Madison uh, is a great place to be for healthcare and uh, get back here when you're ready for the weather. We are not uh, hitting a point of uh, uh, inability to meet resource need. Uh, we're not close to that point at this time. But you know, the other thing uh, that I would worry about is the actual act of coming back here. And this is not a good time to be hanging out at an airport. I'm not sure it's ever a fun time to hang out in an airport, but it's obviously a lot safer to drive in a car uh, for several hours than it is to be in a airport. And although they are much less crowded, still there are many more opportunities to put your hand on the wrong doorknob or to sit on the wrong seat and to not realize that you're uh, you know, getting exposed. So I would discourage people from being in areas where a lot of people have trafficked through. Thank you. Uh, back to a more technical medical question. Is blood type a factor in the likely severity of a COVID-19 case? Uh, Dr. Newcomer? Yeah, well, I hope Bob has an answer to this one because I don't. I don't. We haven't. I haven't seen any data that uh, correlates blood type with severity of COVID nineteen. No, it's uh, blood. Blood type is not related, as far as we can tell, to severity. It is related to this new experimental treatment, 
where you take the plasma from someone who has recovered and infuse their antibodies into somebody who is sick. And in those cases, as with any transfusion, you have to make sure that the blood types are compatible with the uh, transfusion. I think I read something somewhere that said uh, maybe type A was was more prone. I, but I didn't ask that question. Maybe maybe <laughs> someone else saw the same story I did. There's a lot of there's a lot being written, obviously. Um, for Bob, we have a question from Bob from Beloit. Uh, he's seen reports that medical students elsewhere in the country, I think probably particularly in New York, are often graduating early and going to the front lines, but we haven't heard of that happening at UW. Uh, true or not true? And, and if, if we're not doing that, why not? We've given this a lot of thought, as you can imagine. And we had developed a tiered approach to increasing demand uh, based on however uh, aggressive the surge was. And at the first level, we had a large number of recently retired faculty who contacted us and said they wanted to volunteer. And so that was a group of people who already were fully trained and already knew our system. Another tier that we could consider is that we sometimes have advanced training fellows working in areas that have been temporarily shut down. Somebody who completed their entire residency in internal medicine, for example, and they are now in a subspecialty such as gastroenterology, where for now we have halted the elective procedures they would be doing. Bringing them back to work as experienced uh, internists would be a very effective way of uh, uh, expanding our, our capacity. In terms of our medical students, uh, they will be starting residencies, some of them here, but many of them throughout the country, in a matter of just a few months. And to give them the necessary training in everything from electronic health records usage as a uh, attending physician and all the other necessary things, and then knowing that they would then have to repeat that at their new site in just a couple of months, we felt that the juice wasn't going to you know, be worth the squeeze compared to these other ways in which we could expand our capacity. And also training them up would take a lot of our faculty physicians away from the front lines, and they would then have to provide that training for a much larger influx of hundreds and hundreds of new residents who will be coming here. So for that reason, we decided that that would be one of our lower level levers that we would not get to until we started out with the more effective and efficient ones. And Knockwood, fortunately, we haven't had to uh, call out our medical students. Yeah, partly with social distancing, keeping the cases down, uh, yeah. that makes sense. Uh, it's not quite like New York's situation. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, question from Roger, uh, is UW working with any other Big Ten schools or health systems such as University of Michigan or other organizations in collaboration or maybe uh, research projects, uh, sharing information about care. Oh, what absolutely. Like? Yeah. Yeah, it's really a national and an international uh, collaboration on the, uh, on the research front. Uh, for example, the plasma study that I mentioned, uh, that's going on at 40 major academic institutions. Uh, we are also doing a lot collaboratively right here in Wisconsin, not only with our academic partners at Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, but also with our local partners in the local uh, health systems and our uh, school's academic partners in uh, Marshfield and uh, also um, in La Crosse. At the international level, it's really been amazing. You know, there have been at times tensions between, uh, for example, China, where it all began, and the United States. Uh, this was an example where the uh, Chinese government and their scientists immediately released the genetic data that they had on the uh, virus that they had uh, identified. And that really helped us jumpstart our efforts here in the United States. You know, there's an old um, saying in social psychology that the best way to develop peace on Earth is to have a war with Mars. And it's one of the few silver linings to this horrible cloud is that uh, around the world, including in countries where there's been some tensions, people and governments have really come together. Dean of the med school, king of the metaphor, Bob Golden. <laughs> um, so another question from Roger, 
thoughts on the use of face masks to protect public health. Um, I, you know, in the beginning, I think we were told not to wear them. And, and I thought maybe that had to do with the fact that we didn't want to be using equipment that might be needed by the medical system, but it seems like now we're supposed to wear them when we go out. So I think uh, just to answer this one as directly as I can, I think there's no doubt that uh, if you wear a face mask, almost any type of face mask, it will protect you and others around you, in particular if you are coughing or they are coughing at you. Um, the level of face masks is another question. So a cloth face mask versus a medical grade face mask versus the ones I showed in my talk, which were N95, they've got 95% of particles coming through them. You know, what we want to do is preserve the medical grade mask for our frontline workers until we can get it made here in this country or supply chains opened up. Um, and But if you uh, have the ability to use a cloth mask or if you have a, another form of a barrier mask, um, I think the CDC uh, is supportive of that. And, and so are we in our communications with our uh, staff and with the community members. Thank you. Uh, another audience question, can a person be asymptomatic, never get sick, but still be a carrier for a period of time or maybe an indefinite period of time? What do we know about that? There are a uh, large percentage of people who get uh, exposed to coronaviruses, including COVID-19, who don't show symptoms or show very mild symptoms, uh, who then have that infection. In. And it's one of the reasons this spreads so rapidly around the world, because it's so infectious and, and infectious uh, even before you get full-blown symptoms. Um, we uh, would say that that person is infectious for a period of time until their uh, immune system responds and builds that antibody. That's usually within that time frame of about uh, two weeks where that person who doesn't even know it uh, could be infectious uh, to others around them. Uh, another question from Bob for Bob, uh, maybe it's a different Bob, but. Uh, Dr. Golden, you are a psychiatrist. What types of patients do you think are likely to suffer most from the stress of being in a pandemic? That's a great question. And uh, let me answer it in two ways. There are many people who have um, prior histories of uh, recurrent or chronic psychiatric illness, whether it's bipolar disorder, uh, PTSD, uh, other mood and anxiety disorders, and they are at particular risk during times of intense stress, and clearly this is a time of intense stress for everybody to have flare-ups. So it's very important that they continue with their treatment, um, that they continue to take care of themselves in terms of as much as possible having a normal sleep-wake cycle, um, exercising as they can, because all of these are very helpful adjuncts in keeping in remission uh, chronic or recurrent illnesses like uh, uh, anxiety and mood disorders. Even for people who are blessed with having no uh, past history of a diagnosable psychiatric disorder, these are very, very difficult times, uh, especially for folks that um, already are, have been facing other stresses, whether they're economic stresses or stresses in relationships. So it's very important to take care of oneself, to look for the warning signs that you might be coming down with the early warning signs and symptoms of a clinical depression or an anxiety disorder. And help is available. Even with all the social distancing, there are resources available online. There are resources available through various helplines that the national organizations have. So it's a time for all of us to take care of ourselves and to be aware that we are all vulnerable for showing the uh, stresses and strains of this difficult period. Thank you for right. saying that, yeah. Could I say something to this? And it's not about the, the psychiatric part of it, that's Bob's department, but um, I think this really uh, is a question that uh, makes me think about all the other illness that's out there in the world. Everybody is talking about COVID-19 right now, um, appropriately but there are a lot of other illnesses out there and there are a lot of other people out there that are suffering. And uh, we are seeing in some of our national data that people aren't coming in for that care when they should be, whether it's psychiatric care uh, or whether it's medical care for other things like heart disease or strokes. And we, uh, like most health systems can care for you. You need to contact your, your provider 
talk to them virtually at first, but please don't ignore those symptoms. We're seeing uh, the number of people showing up with cardiac issues dramatically lower than it should be right now. And that's probably mm. because people aren't getting the care they need. So I, I just would encourage people to think about that in, in, in light of, uh, of uh, protecting health from other reasons too. A great reminder. I've been eating a lot of Ruffles potato chips lately. <laughs> Makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, another question uh, coming in from Lori, and it's about the reliability of testing. Uh, we hear a lot about false positives, but also false negatives. Um, can you say anything about whether we think there's a high incidence of false negatives with COVID-19 testing? Well, the answer to that, like every question about test is it depends. It depends on which test. Uh, it depends on when you do it. So COVID-19 testing at UW Health is what I'll speak to because there's other tests out there. But our test is a PCR test. It looks at the RNA itself. Um, and it's a very sensitive test. Um, and the problem is, of course, that you have to get the swab in the nose and do that right first to get the sample uh, and get that sample to the lab for it to be sensitive for what you found. The other thing is that early on in the illness, if you're not shedding it into your nose, you don't have any symptoms at that time, you may not have a positive test. It can just be in your lung lining and your cells a replicating virus. So it's, there's there's the question about, is that really, um, some people hear a false negative and it's really not a false negative. It was negative because it wasn't in the nasopharyngeal area where the swab would go. It could have turned positive the next day. And then of course there are true false positive, false negatives actually with every test. Um, and um, I, I think it really gets down to which test are you doing. As new tests come out, I think that's worrying us even more as we have some of these rapid tests and some of these serologic tests uh, that look for immune globulin. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity of those will be different than the first PCR tests we have done as well. So kind of just depends on which one you're getting. Thank you. Uh, question from Steve, uh, how are your healthcare professionals holding up and what can the rest of us do to support them through this difficult time, Dr. Newcomer? Yeah, this is uh, this has been, I think for many of us, uh, one of the most stressful times in our career, whether you're a health system leader or the dean of a medical school, or whether you're a frontline nurse or a respiratory tech in our health system, it has been incredibly stressful. Um, not just because of the risk to yourself and your family or because of the unknown that's coming at you. You just don't know what's going to happen next. Um, that has been incredibly difficult on everyone. Um, and the prolonged nature of this event and the fact that it is going to go on for a while is wearing on people. And then you add to the fact that uh, everyone's isolated when they get, go home. They don't have that social network that we need uh, to recover uh, from some of those difficulties of being a provider of care. Um, in general, our teams have been amazing and they get energy from caring for patients like they always have. Um, I, I find, and I think this is true in a lot of health systems, that the closer our providers are to the patients, including COVID positive patients, the better off they are. The further away, the more time they have away from clinical care and time to kind of read and watch news and worry, uh, the harder it is for them. So um, it's been an interesting uh, phenomenon in our healthcare system and I think in many others. And I think we need help from people on our uh, mental health teams to care for them. Our mental health providers have developed um, rapid online, uh, online and phone consultation for everyone because they know how stressful this is for our teams. And so they are more available to us than they've ever been uh, before as well. Uh question for either one of you, maybe Bob, you can take the first crack at it. Um, will transmission and or severity of the COVID-19 disease, do you think decline as we get into warmer weather in this part of the country? Well, if I had a coin in my hand, I would toss it because it really kind of is a bit of a coin toss. On the one hand, Many other coronaviruses show a seasonality. On the other hand, if we look at very temperate climates like New Orleans, um, it, it's been a, a raging fire there. So it doesn't suggest that warmth uh, is protective. Um, as we look at changes in photo period, as the days get longer, I don't know if that could have a biological effect. So I, I think the straight the straight uh, up answer is we, we just don't know and we won't know until the months pass by. Unless Pete, you have some other uh, perspectives on that. 
Nope, I think you said it right. I, I, I think we're probably a little more pessimistic than I, I would be a little more pessimistic than optimistic just based on what you said and including in the uh, equatorial regions of the world where we're seeing lots of cases. It's not just New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, last week we had a panel of investors sort of talking about the economic dimensions of the COVID crisis and, of course, uh, what the likelihood would be of a sharp recovery or a long, slow slog. And, of course, some of that depended on the views of a week ago. And, of course, these views are evolving all the time uh, of just how long this might go on and inevitably led to some commentary uh, from them about medical issues. And uh, I thought I'd flip the switch here and give you guys a chance to opine about the stock market. Um, Pete, uh, where do you think the S&P is going to finish the year? Yeah, I, you think the market you know, I'm not right, crazy? right. I'm not worried about the stock market. I'm worried about the guy down the street whose business is under strain and the person who had to lay off people uh, because they couldn't afford to pay them. And I'm worried about healthcare systems, just like I'm worried about every business in our state and in our country, really under siege from this virus uh, financially. Um, I think those uh, effects will ultimately affect the stock market, but I'm not gonna make any guess on that. I think uh, we need to do everything we can to support our neighbors and our community members. There's a lot of people under strain other than and beyond people dealing with just this uh, disease. Well, I'm willing to go out on a limb Okay, and I'm willing to make this prediction for the record. I predict that four months from now, the stock market will either be up, down, or unchanged. I think it'll be up or down. <laughs> so um, let's see, what, where else do we want to go here tonight? Uh, do you have any questions for each other? I've got one more good audience question, uh, if you would. So. Uh, obviously, we know we can acquire the COVID virus through contact, so touching surfaces where uh, the virus might live, and we can also get it by inhaling aerosol. Is one or the other of those somehow m a higher, more highly likely to transmit the infection? Yeah, I think the thing I'd say there is it has to get to a mucosal surface, right? So even if you touch a surface with your hands, that has COVID-19 on it, which isn't really that easy to do. It does uh, not last forever there, right? You know, it, it does take some time to go away. And if you clean that surface, you can get rid of it pretty easily with basic cl cleaners. But if it is on your hands, you don't get it. It has to get to your mouth, your nose, your eyes for you to get it. Uh, so, I, you know, getting coughed on or having droplets transmit uh, COVID-19 to your respiratory tract is a lot easier than the two part, touch something and then touch your face. The key thing is, uh, you know, the, the simple basic stuff, uh, hand washing, uh, and you can protect yourself even if you've, even if you've been exposed to it um, in that way. Are either of you optimistic about some of the treatments that have been discussed for um, maybe treating and moderating the severity of the COVID virus in patients? Uh, either of you comment on that? I think I, I'd be happy to comment on the treatments that are out there right now. I think we're always optimistic in healthcare that these treatments are going to uh, help us. And we're optimistic that there are people uh, looking at new things every day, uh, whether they're antivirals or things uh, that you've heard about in the national press, like uh, hydroxychloroquine. I would say there is no, it's hard to have any optimism without any evidence that supports any of these things. And there uh, so far isn't any good evidence that supports uh, any of uh, the treatments we have out there, but we have a lot of people looking, we have a lot of things in trials, and we have a lot of uh, vaccination trials that are starting in humans, so th that's all That's all optimistic to me. And I'd say if you uh, look at the history of other horrible epidemics, and none of them were exactly like this, but they had some similarities, whether it's polio, which was a horrible epidemic in the 1950s, or more recently, HIV, or what we have done to really eliminate some other horrible infectious diseases worldwide in other uh, nations where they are especially painful. There is every reason to be optimistic that with the strength of American biomedical research and the collaboration worldwide with other countries that are also uh, sophisticated working on this, I am optimistic that we will get there how quickly we get there depends not only on how effective these research efforts are, but how we continue to be effective in giving these research efforts more time through social distancing, hand washing, and, and good old 
uh, common sense approaches to uh, slow down the, uh, uh, the spread. And when it is time to, and I hope it will be soon, when it is time to turn back on uh, the economic uh, activities that are very important for sustaining uh, lives as well, we have to be prepared that it will not be a flick of a switch. It should be a careful, cautious turning of a rheostat. Uh, because if we flick a switch and have a huge recurrence all of a sudden, that will make the uh, timeline that much more scary for when we do have safe and effective treatments. Yeah, that's really kind of the great irony of this. I think we've flattened the peaks quite a bit by social distancing, but that has probably kept a lot of people from getting infected, which means it's maybe easier for it to come back and transmit again. And until we really have very effective treatments or right. widespread and cheap testing and contact tracing, it seems like it'll be difficult for the economy to really open in earnest. So, uh, and of course that depends on how individuals feel. And I think there'll be a lot of individuals that'll be cautious for a while, no matter what uh, anyone might say, uh, it's kind of up to the individual. So, um, well, you know, one thing I'm confident about, I do think on the other side of this, people will have a much greater appreciation for research universities, great science and community. And uh, that's really what these sessions are all about. I'd like to thank our audience on YouTube tonight uh, and I especially want to thank our guests, Dr. Newcomer and Dr. Golden, and thank them for all they do to support public health. Uh, it's really a pleasure to work with both of you. And then looking ahead, uh, we've got a special event this Thursday, April 16th at 7 p.m. We'll have former band director and icon Mike LaCrone and his successor here at UW, Corey Pompey, uh, and they'll be visiting with my colleague, Sarah Shute, and that will be followed by a PBS presentation of Mike LaCrone, Wisconsin's showman. So uh, don't we all wish we could be that? Um, and then next week, uh, please join us for our UW Now episode where we'll feature Chancellor Rebecca Blank and men's basketball Big Ten Coach of the Year, Greg Gard. So thank you and good night.